Hi students, this is Amrit here. Welcome back to my channel. So today we will start with the listening practice test of 12th June 2023. This is the recent real exam test and this is quite important for both academic and GT students. So uh, before starting this test, uh, the, uh, uh, the candidates who are new to my channel and uh, who haven't subscribed yet, uh, so please do subscribe my channel first and uh, let's start. And uh, one more important thing uh, so uh, there is the uh, my telegram uh, group please join this telegram group for the free material of IELTS and follow me on the Instagram the link is in description box so let's start the test and all the best students is in four part part one part two part three and part four now look at part one part one you are going to hear an orientation talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Welcome to Orientation Week. Today I am here with the captain of our school's women's gymnastics team. Her name is Elizabeth Rain, and she is a fourth-year student. I hope you can all see her as an example of a responsible student and athlete a role model for everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for stopping by our orientation week. Thank you for having me. Welcome to our university, everyone. If there are any of you thinking about joining our school's athletic program, I would strongly encourage you to do it. Being a part of the gymnastics team has been one of my best experiences during my time at this school. It has taught me so much about teamwork and friendship, and has even taught me how to improve my academics by prioritizing my time. I have some questions that I am sure the students will want to know the answers to as well. First of all, how did you find the time to do well in classes as well as train for gymnastics? Prioritizing is the key. You must be very organized. Every day I wake up and I know what I must do for the day. I plan things in order of importance. For example, if today I have a competition for gymnastics in the afternoon, then I know I have to finish my homework and studying in the morning. In other words, keeping an organized schedule of your priorities is very important. Can you explain to the students a little bit about your study habits? Well, I usually try to take classes that I'm interested in. This way, I have no excuse not to study because I chose the classes out of my own preference. I separate my study time by class. For example, if I have five classes for this semester, I will study for one class a day from Monday through Friday and then review for all of them on the weekend. I won't try and study for all five of my classes at one time. It is too hard to do that, to remember everything and not feel like you are going crazy. It is very important to focus the time that you set aside for studying. I do not study with the television on. I try to keep away from all distractions because I find that I learn better that way. But of course, how each individual will study depends on each person. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. That sounds like good advice. Let's talk a little bit about your gymnastics career. How long have you been doing this sport for, and what has been the best moment of your college participation? Well, I've been participating in gymnastics since I was a kid. My parents got me involved in the sport. Hmm, the best moment. 
I would have to say that there is not one single instance that stands out in my mind as the best moment, but more of a whole experience. My first year in university was definitely one of the best years of my life. I met my best friends that year and really learned to grow up and be independent. Our team went to the national championships that year, and it was an incredible experience, so I would count the whole year as my best experience in college. How about the worst moment? It is true, everyone goes through bad experiences. My worst experience would have to be the fall of last year, when I broke my wrist. I was unable to participate in sports for the remainder of the year and had to learn how to write with my left hand. I guess when I look back at it, though, even though I wouldn't wish this to happen to anyone, this experience definitely made me stronger as a person. It taught me to look at life with a new perspective and to really value the friends and family that are important and close to me. Thanks for your time, Elizabeth. Do you have anything else you want to tell the new students? Just have a good time. Don't stress out too much, but be responsible for your actions. Work hard and play hard. That's my motto for life. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students discussing the subject of rock art. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Sorry I'm a bit late. Oh, no problem. Thanks for agreeing to help me with my assignment today. I really needed to go over it with someone. Sure. You were going to talk about European rock art, weren't you? Yes, the rock drawings in the caves of Lascaux in western France. Oh, fantastic. Over 13,000 years old, I believe. What sort of drawings are they? They're drawings of animals, on the whole, but you can also find some human representations, as well as some signs. There are roughly 600 drawings at Lascaux. Really? Were they mostly pictures of bulls? Well, no, actually. The animal most depicted was the horse. Hmm. Have a look at this graph. Hmm. It shows the distribution of the different animals. You see? First the horse, and then, after that, a sort of prehistoric bull. Oh, OK. That's interesting, isn't it? And the third most commonly drawn creature was the stag. There were some other animals, but these are the main ones. What are the drawings like? I mean, what sort of style? Well, the bulls are depicted very figuratively. They're not very realistic. They're very big by comparison to the other drawings of people and signs. They appear to be almost three-dimensional in some cases, following the contours of the cave walls, but of course they're not. Amazing. Perhaps they felt these animals were the most impressive and needed to be represented like that. Yeah, maybe. The drawings of humans, by contrast, consist of just simple lines, like the stick figures my little sister draws. Perhaps humans were seen as less important. Hmm, perhaps. What about the signs? How did they draw them? There doesn't appear to be much evidence of signs, and those that have been found are usually made up of little points. Rather like Aboriginal art from Australia? Yes, something like that, but not as complex, of course. So, apart from the bulls and horses and stags, were there any other creatures depicted? In one or two chambers you do find pictures of fish, oh. but they're quite rare. What sort of size is the cave? It must be quite large to have that many pictures. Well, it's actually a number of interlinking chambers, really. 
Here's a map showing where the different drawings can be found. Oh, good. Let's have a look at that. The first 20 metres inside the cave slope down very steeply to the first hall in the network. That's called the Great Hall of the Bulls. Here. OK. Then, off to the left, we have the Painted Gallery, which is about 30 metres long and is basically a continuation of this first hall. But further into the cave. Exactly. Oh. Then we find a second, lower gallery called the Lateral Passage. This opens off the aisle to the right of the Great Hall of the Bulls. It connects the next chamber with an area known as the Main Gallery. At the end of the Main Gallery is the Chamber of Felines. There are one or two other connecting chambers, but there's no evidence of man having been in these rooms. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Is the cave open to the public today? Well, no, because after the initial discovery in 1940, it was opened and literally millions of people came through to see the drawings. Uh. Then, in the 50s, the experts started to worry about the damage being done to the drawings and the government finally closed the Lascaux cave in 1963. Is that so? It wasn't really the tourists that were doing the harm, but the fact that after thousands of years, the cave was suddenly open to the atmosphere and so bacteria and fungi started to destroy the pictures. You need a special permit to enter the cave now, and very few people can get that, unless they're scientists or have some official status. It's a shame, but I can see that they had to do something to protect the cave. So that means you can no longer see this rock art? Well, not exactly. What they've done is recreate the drawings in a man-made cave, which you can visit. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. The authorities decided to reproduce the two best sections of the site, so they've created a life-size copy of the Hall of the Bulls and of the Painted Gallery. It's just a cement shell, which corresponds in shape to the interior of the original. So now you can visit the caves without actually harming any of the 15,000-year-old paintings. Mm -hmm. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor giving some business students instructions about a finance project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. OK, can you quieten down, please? Now, today I'm going to talk to you about your assignment. We've been studying the effects of the exchange rate, so I'm going to give you a project to do on this. Right, can you make some notes while I'm talking? The first thing that I'd like you to do in order to prepare this is to select where you're interested in. I mean, which country, and therefore which currency you're going to be operating in. OK, now the purpose of the project is to make money, and I'm hoping some of you will make a significant amount. 
So, I want you to suppose that you have 100 pounds that you will have to invest purely in the rises and falls of the exchange system. In other words, you'll be trying to predict rates. This is a project that you'll be doing together, but before you work together, you'll have to go off and research what you need to know about the economy of that country and how well it's doing or is expected to do in the near future. You could all make up a little information sheet with your notes on, clearly legible, because then I want you to get together, we can do that next week, and to go round and read about each other's countries. When you see how well or badly each country is doing, I want you to decide what your exchange rate is going to be against all the other currencies. After that is all sorted, what you're going to do is go around the other students and attempt to sell your money to the others. Remember, this will depend on the success of your country's economy and the rate you fixed for your currency. Now, you're not allowed to just swap currencies with each other, but you may wish to buy from the other countries. But you must do a proper transaction. All the way through this, you must keep your accounts properly for each transaction. I'll give you one week to do this, and then we will set a time for the deals to finish, a bit like the stock exchange. And at that point, I will ask you to calculate how much you have made. Is that clear? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Before you begin that, there are a few things I want you to read up on to prepare. You need to look at the economies of the UK's main trading partners. I don't mean all of them, because that would be over 80, but just the 29 principal ones. There are summaries in the last three books on the book list I've given you. And so that you can practice applying the criteria on assessment I gave you, I'd then like you to focus just on one sector across all the countries. The most common one across every country is farming. But as much agricultural produce is for domestic consumption, I'd like you to look at manufacturing. Then, I would like you to do a detailed investigation of one particular aspect. I was going to give you a choice, but I think as we've just started the course, it's better if we all look at the same thing and then we can discuss it in the seminars. So, the thing I'd like you all to look at is fluctuations in import prices. Now, you need to do all that before you start the project, as it will help you assess the economies of the countries you'll be representing in the project. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Exam week is December the 8th, then it's the holidays until January the 6th, so I don't need the project in till February the 5th. Is that okay? Now, any questions on this? Because it's That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on bullying in the workplace given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervin Forrest, and I specialize in management techniques and training. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace, or to put it more simply, bullying. It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to four billion pounds a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that what is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers, and not a conscious effort to attack someone. But that is perhaps a case of、um, of my being naive or over hopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points.、Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes. Right. Off we go. The first item on the list. Is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is, in fact, a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts. Especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task, this is not bad management. It is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. Sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique. Especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails, this is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands, which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice, with offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action. I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced, and perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes. 
Okay, you've got twenty minutes to do this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test.